Hey guys, today we're setting up dynamic running and walking footstep sounds for every single material in our level here. Let's get to it. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode and today we are setting up dynamic footstep sounds for walking, running, but also landing when jumping. And the real complexity here is that the material that the player lands on really needs to determine the sound. But there's an additional layer of complexity that I want to add on to this and that is the fact that if there are other human characters in our game, I want them to be able to use the same footstep sounds. I mean, I suppose if they have totally different shoes, if they have like boots versus like sandals or something like that, the footstep sounds will be different. But for the most part, I'm gonna keep that pretty consistent. And so by the end of this episode, so that we can use these sounds for any character in our game, we're gonna use a new piece of functionality that you haven't seen before in this series called a blueprint function library. And that's gonna make the functions that we create universally accessible. So there's a lot of new concepts in this episode. This is the first episode in this series where we're working with our animation blueprint, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. We're gonna be working in that a lot. And the first part of this is with something called Anim Notifies. For the first four of these concepts, these are going to help us assess, okay, when the player's foot actually lands, what material are they hitting and what sound needs to play? And so we're gonna assess that via a sphere trace that goes from basically the player's hip down to their foot, and then it's gonna match on a physical material. And based on that physical material, it's gonna use a switch node to play the appropriate sound. And another thing that we haven't done before in this series is pass inputs, basically pass variables into a function. And that's exactly how we're going to communicate from our character's animation blueprint over to the blueprint function library. So there's a lot of preparation steps if you want to follow along this episode. As always, you can find every single footstep sound that I'm using via a link to the spreadsheet in the description below. These are all Zapsplat sounds. You can download them all for free. The only limitation is you've got to wait about 10 minutes between each three sounds that you download. And if you download them for free from Zapsplat, you have to get them in MP3 format, which means you need to convert them to WAV files before you use them in UE5. So I do that via Audacity, but you can use any program you want. The other important caveat here is cut the beginning portion of the sound so that the main sound starts immediately. And the reason for that is so that we can synchronize the sound exactly with the footstep. Now for the other stuff here, I'll just walk through how I set it. And for the last item on this list, I struggled a bit until I figured this out. For your landscape, in order to get the material at every part of your landscape, you're going to need to set generate overlap events on every piece of your landscape. So I'm gonna start this by going over the attenuation assets and the sound cues I set up, and then we'll get into the build. All right, so the first thing I wanna go over is my initial setup before we really get into this episode. So I created a subfolder under sound for character sounds, and then within that I have a human sounds because we're gonna have other, th I don't wanna spoil it, but we're gonna have other things in our game other than humans. And so under human, then we have footsteps. And of course there's gonna be other human sounds like shouts or ah! I probably should cut that. Anyway, footsteps. And then I divided footsteps into these six folders, two attenuation assets. Let's talk about the two attenuation assets first. We have our hard surface. So basically in this case, the sounds are going to decrease at a slower rate than a soft surface. So examples of that are stepping on wood, stepping on stone. So I have the inner radius set to 50 there and our fall off distance set to 950. And then for our soft surface, it's about half of that. Our inner radius still 50, fall off distance 450. Because you gotta think about for that footstep, it's gonna be loudest in that inner radius right when the foot actually hits the ground and then it'll diminish quickly if it's a soft surface. One last suggestion here, don't enable spatialization for the footstep sounds. I just found it distracting when I heard like a footstep sound on the right and then a left, it just, it just didn't feel right. So let me just go through real quick how I set up the sound cues for each of these. So each of these five folders is divided into jump land sounds, run and walk sounds. And again, you can find all of these sounds in the description below via the spreadsheet. So if I go into jump land, for example, in some of these cases, I have specific sounds for jump landing. In other cases, I just recycled sounds used for walking or running. And that was basically a judgment call on my part based on how the sounds actually sounded. So for example, if I go into this forest floor queue, I'll just go into each of these cues. What I'm using here are the running sounds in conjunction with the jump land sound. So the random node basically randomizes which one of these plays, but it always plays in conjunction with the jump land sound. So all together, always sounds similar, but a little bit different with every jump landing. 
If you're recreating this build exactly, there are a couple things to make sure to get right. So under output, make sure you copy my volume multipliers and I just experimented with those to get the right volume for each footstep. And then also make sure to get the attenuation settings. So it's either gonna be one of those two attenuation settings, but this way by setting it directly in the queue, I don't need to mess with it again in blueprints. And I'll just go through each of the other 14 cues. I know these are a lot of sounds guys, but if you just have one or two footstep sounds and it sounds the same every single time, it just doesn't sound good. So now I'm gonna go over to our run and our cue there. And for most of these, very simple. All I did was I selected all the sounds, created a single cue from it, it automatically randomizes, and then in the output I adjusted the volume and added the attenuation. Here's our forest floor walk, here's grass jump land, here's grass running, here's grass walking, very quiet on grass. So this one I'm using for dirt, for gravel, basically sounds very similar. And this is for running, and this is for walking. Now onto rock or stone or concrete, this is jump land. This is running, this is walking. Then we have these for wet dirt. It's basically gonna be more of a squelch. So not like mud per se, but just a little bit, you'll see. So this is jump land and this is running. Let me just play this to show you, but I'll crank up the volume so you could hear it better. Yeah, it's just got a little bit of that wetness sound to it. So put it back down to 0 0.2. And this is our walking. Last one, wood. This is jump land, this is running. And last but not least, this is walking. All right, so if you've completed all those preparation steps, then we are ready to rock and roll. And the way this starts is we need some sort of trigger mechanism in the animation because really it's based on, okay, when the foot comes down in the animation, that's when we're gonna trigger a footstep sound. It's something called an animation notify or abbreviated anim notify. And to use these, we need to work in what's called the animation blueprint. And it's our first time working in animation blueprints. If you're using the standard UE5 mannequin like I am, we've got Manny and Quinn. For me, it's gonna be Manny. But in the very beginning of this series, I actually duplicated this and I created my own ABP, my own animation blueprint and that's located under content core for me. So I have this ABP third person character, but you just need to navigate to whichever one your character is using. If you're not sure what that is, you can go into your main character, your third person character. And then if you navigate over to the mesh, you can then find the anim class right here. That's your animation blueprint. So the animation blueprint is what's going to coordinate the sounds, but the mechanism that actually sends the notification to the animation blueprint, that's gonna be done directly in the animations themselves. And so for that, if you navigate to your content folder into characters, mannequins, and then animations. So we have our Manny animations and our Quinn animations. I'm playing Manny, but you can adjust whichever you're playing. So if I go into Manny, the three animations that we're gonna to need to adjust this episode are our run, our walk, and then our jump landing. But we're gonna save the jump landing for last. So if you navigate into our run, and I'm just gonna pause this down here. So all this is doing is it's looping the running animation. And you see it's about 60 frames per second. And we actually have some markers here when the left foot comes down. So if you drag over there, you can see, okay, left foot down there, where our right foot comes down, et cetera. But what I found in playing with this is we actually have to have the anim notifies a little bit later than each of these markers in order for the sound to sound realistic. But basically what we're going to do is very similar to these markers right here. We're gonna add our own markers that then communicate back to the animation blueprint and based on that communication then we can generate a sound from it so to do that we're going to right click anywhere on that line and say add notify and under skeleton notifies there are already two standard notifies for left foot plant and right foot plant so we're going to add those directly to the right of each of the l's and the r's you just want to leave a little bit of space so right about there is good and we'll do the same thing with the r here and we got to do that for each of these and so at that point in the animation, that's when it's gonna play the sound. And all the way at the end here for the R. And by the way, if you're using a Manny character and it's showing Quinn here, very easy way to change that. We could just go to preview mesh. I'm gonna select Manny simple, and then I can say apply to asset. And then it's got Manny there from then on. So now we'll go on to our walking animation. And so for this, we need to add the anim notifies to the right of each of the markers as well, but the gap there doesn't need to be nearly as large. So maybe like a full diamond or half a diamond. So if you right click on empty space, add notify, we're gonna add our left foot plant. I'm just gonna move that over until it's right about there, like a slight overlap with the other diamond. And just repeat that for each of the markers. And by the way, the only way I figured this out was just with a bunch of trial and error, figuring out when the sound sounded best. So it should look something like this when you're all set.
All right, so now how do we test to make sure that the Anim Notify is actually working, that it's actually communicating to our animation blueprint? Well, the first thing we got to do is we got to go into that animation blueprint. So you could just open that up, just going to change our preview mesh here. And so immediately we're brought to our event graph for our animation blueprint. And if you don't already have a lot of familiarity with blueprints or events, I recommend checking out episode four, where I cover this in extensive detail. So we have a couple of events already set up here on our animation blueprint. And the way we call Anim notifies is the same way via an event. So I'm just going to zoom in below and I'm going to right click and search for L foot plant. And we have an option for event Adam notify L foot plant. And so what's going to happen is if that animation is playing and it hits that event, it's going to execute whatever's coming out of this pin right here. And so let's test that right now. So I can just do a print string. And what I'll say is like left foot plant. And by the way, if you get this no debug data thing, you could just change this over to no debug object selected and they'll stop that. No, not left foot plan plant and then compile save. Let's test this out. And there it is. So in the top left corner, as soon as I start walking, every time my left foot lands, yep, I see a left foot plant and we know our event is working. So, so far, so good. I'm going to delete that out. We're also going to get our Anim notify right foot plant. There we go. All right. So now it starts getting a little bit tricky because we need to figure out where we're going to play this sound because we can't just play it generally, right? We want it to be louder if we're close to the player's feet or any character's foot for that matter. And we want it to be less loud the further we are away from it. So we've got to play the sound at the specific location where the foot hits the ground. And the way we're going to do that is with something called a trace or more specifically, we're going to use a sphere trace. And you can think of tracing in UE5 as a way of finding a location, basically saying from this point to this point, when does collision occur? Like when does it hit that object and getting the location of that hit? But not only that, getting the information needed of that hit, like what material did we just hit? I mean, this is going to be useful for all sorts of things. If we have like a bow and arrow and it hits stone, we need to know, okay, that's stone. So it's not going to embed itself directly in there. Whereas wood, it's like, okay, embed it directly in the tree. So anyway, back to tracing. So why am I doing a sphere trace? Well, I tried just a simple line trace and for whatever reason, it's not working on landscapes, but sphere tracing is working just fine. But also it kind of makes sense because the foot is kind of in a spherical shape, not really kind of oblong, but close enough. So we can make the sphere roughly the size and shape of the foot. And that's going to be what hits the ground. So how do we do a sphere trace? Well, we need to figure out where it's going to originate and where it's going down to. And so typically what I do is I originate these at waist level because that's where the leg is really starting. So for example, if we do a sphere trace just at ankle level, the problem is if the player moves their leg way up, like they're stepping onto something, it's not going to be a high enough start that it's going to hit that thing that they're stepping on. So how do we get the location of the player's waist? So to start, we need to get the player's general location. So we need to come under variables here to references, and I'm just going to drag in character. We're going to get a reference to our character and from character, we can then get the character's world location. And when we do that, we have choices for capsule component and mesh. In general, I always use the capsule because the mesh is actually encapsulated by the capsule. The capsule is the root component, and I'm just going to make some space here. All right. So now we got to actually get our sphere trace node. So if you right click and you do a sphere trace by channel, so we're not doing a multi sphere trace, right? Because we want this to stop the second it collides with something because whatever it hits, that's going to be the sound. A multi sphere would be useful if we need something to hit and then keep going and keep hitting things across an entire distance. So we're going to do a sphere trace by channel. And so our sphere trace by channel, I'm going to connect this up and then we've got a start and our end. So our start is actually going to be the exact world location of our capsule, but then the end. So that's going to be a little bit tricky, right? Because it's got to go down. So all I'm going to do here is I'm just going to subtract from the vector and down is always our Z value. So Z I'm just going to do negative 120 and then we'll connect that to the end. And now the radius is okay. How big is that sphere? That's actually going to trace downward and try to find something. So that's going to be about 10 here, 10 centimeters. So our basic sphere trace is now set up, but how do we test this? So there's a really neat debug option here. So I'm going to select this to be for duration and our duration is about five seconds. So basically whenever this triggers, you're going to see a drawn sphere trace from hopefully the waist down to the foot or down below the feet for about five seconds. So let's test that out now. So compile and save. Let's go in and play step, 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 step. Yeah, you see those sphere traces there. So they're originating at roughly waist level. And you see that there's this little green ball at the bottom of that. 
And what that's indicating is that, yep, it actually hit. So we know at this point that our sphere trace is working. So I'm gonna go back in our animation blueprint. And so now let's take this one step at a time. The first step is, will this actually play a sound when the trace hits something? And so if I say return value, I'm gonna do a branch from that. And if the return is true, meaning it does hit something, well, let's play a sound. And I could just select any of our sound cues, but let's do footstep and I'll just choose dirt jump land. Why not? Compile, save, let's test that out. And keep in mind, the sound now is not at any specific location. Bump, 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 bump. Yeah, so obviously that doesn't make sense since we're on grass, but the sound's working, the sound is playing. But obviously now that leads to the question, how do we tie different sounds to different materials in the game? So if I'm stepping on grass, how do we make it play a grass sound? And so for this, there's a couple of different steps and we get to start with something called physical materials. And what I recommend for this is we're gonna to navigate to our shared assets folder. So back in content, if you go into our third person folder and then over to maps and then our third person map shared assets, I recommend actually creating the physical materials here. This might be counterintuitive. You can create them anywhere really, but they're related to each of these layers that we've already painted on our landscape. If you followed along in, I think it's episode seven. So anyway, to create a physical material, we got to right click, we have to go under physics and then we have our physical material option and we have to pick our material class. We'll just select physical material. And this first one, I'm just gonna label grass underscore PM for physical material. And let's go into that. So physical materials, what are they? So they're used to define a dynamic response to every object, every material in the game. So for example, if something hits a balloon as opposed to a rock, it's going to have a radically different response, even though the two things might be comparatively sized. And so that's where physical materials come into play. So something like density here. And once we get into physics in this series, and we will, and it's gonna be a lot of fun, then you'll really see how this comes together. For now, the only thing we really need to worry about here is what's called the surface type. And right now there's nothing available here, but depending on the surface type, that's what's going to trigger a specific sound to the material. So how do we add surface types to this list? So if you minimize our physical material and we have to go over to our settings and then our project settings. And here I'm just gonna search for surface up top. And then we have our physical surfaces and we have a default one, but then also we can have up to 62 custom surface types. We're only gonna use six for this episode. So I'm just gonna list these out. We've got our forest floor. All these need to be one word. We've got grass, we've got dirt. Everybody loves dirt. We got stone, we got wet dirt and the last one's wood. So now if I come back into our physical material, go to that list and voila, there's our list. So our grass physical material is going to be a surface type of grass and save. And so now how do we actually connect that physical material to our real materials, to our objects that are in the game? It's a little bit different depending on the object, but let's talk real quick about landscapes. So in episode seven, we painted our landscape with multiple layers. And so we have our air quadrant, like an air layer, earth, fire, water. And these were different materials that we used in our landscape material. And so if I go into, for example, the air quadrant, air layer, we have an opportunity here to define what physical material was used for that paintable layer. So I'm just gonna come up here and I'm gonna select grass underscore PM. Now the last thing here, and I mentioned this in the intro, but this is really important. This might not work unless you set this. So you gotta go under your landscape and for every single part of your landscape here, so select every single one of those. If you scroll down and you just gotta make sure that this generate overlap events is checked because if you don't check that, it might not find the correct material on your landscape. But now let's actually test to see if it's gonna get that grass material. So if we go back to our animation blueprint, so instead of playing a sound, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take our hit information because whenever it hits with that sphere trace, it's gathering information about what it's hitting. And then we can break apart that hit result. And based on all the information that it's getting, what we really need is the physical material. And what we really need from that is the surface type of that physical material. So that's the list of options that we selected from. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do a print string if the hit occurs and we're gonna print the surface type here. So what should happen is if we're not on grass, this isn't going to work because I only assigned the physical material to the grass part of our landscape. And so what should happen with this is for the most part, I think it's just gonna print a surface type of default because the only thing that we've actually assigned a physical material to is this air layer here. And that's really just this one part of our garden. And the only reason I know that is because, well, we did that in episode seven. And I'm gonna go over how to assign the physical materials to all sorts of things. So if you're not using a landscape, you're just doing this with static 
static meshes, it's actually way easier. This part's only necessary if you use landscape layers. All right, but let's test this out. Grass, 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 perfect. And then if I run over to another part of our quadrant, let's take a look. Default, default, default. Yeah, because now we're in our fire quadrant, and for this particular part of our landscape, I didn't assign a physical material yet to it. So that's exactly what we're going to do right now. We're gonna create five additional physical materials to give us six to match the six types of sounds, and then we're gonna assign those to every part of our landscape and every single mesh or material that's part of our level. So let's duplicate our grass PM, and I'll just keep duplicating this over and over until we have six of these. So this one's going to be forest floor underscore PM. This one's going to be dirt underscore PM. Stone, wet dirt, wood. All right, now we just gotta go into each of these, make sure the surface types line up. So now we've got our physical materials. Let's start with our landscape, matching those up, and then we'll go from there. So I already went into our air layer, so now the earth layer. And for this, this is just gonna be dirt. And the fire layer is gonna be grass. And by the way, you'll only need to do this if you followed my series exactly, or if you have a landscape and you know what kind of material should be matched to each part of your landscape. Then our water part of our landscape, and this is going to be our forest floor. So now another really quick test. We're gonna start over here, and then if I run over to our forest, that should be forest floor. Grass, grass, good. And we're moving over, forest floor, excellent. So now we've got to update the physical materials for basically every single material that we're using throughout our level, or at least every material that we're going to step on. And this is arduous, but really we've got to do it to give it that realistic feel. And so let me just show you how to do this for an example static mesh. And this is our bridge that we set up in episodes 11 and 12. If I break this packed level actor, then I can select a part of it. So for example, the wooden piece, and I can get our material here. And what you're going to need to do is update the physical material in each actual material. So if you go into that, and if you scroll down, so I'm going to move my head a little bit here. So our physical material right there. So this is going to be our wood underscore PM. And we could just test this out really quick, make sure it works. Yeah, stepping wood, wood, wood. And now you might have some static meshes that you're using as foliage assets. And so an example of that is we've got our pebbles here, our rocky Nordic ground. And so for this, I actually have to do a couple of things to get this working. So I'm gonna navigate over to our 3D assets, lakes, rivers, paths, main palette. And this is our Nordic beach, rocky ground. The first thing I need to do is I need to add collision to the asset. So if I go into the mesh, doesn't need to be a complex collision of any kind. So collision, I'm just gonna add 26 DOP. The next thing I've got to do is I've got to go into the foliage asset. Now I don't want this collision to be for the player because if the player's kind of bouncing off the rocks or their feet are kind of hovering off the rocks, it's not going to look good. But instead of no collision here, I'm just going to say ignore only pawn. And that way collision will work for things like the sphere trace, but for our pawn, our player who's actually running across these rocks or really any other character, which are also going to be pawns, it's not going to have any effect. And so then I can go into the material for these if I scroll down, I can give it a physical material. So this is going to be our dirt underscore PM. I know it's gravel, but basically I'm treating the two as having the same sound. So let's test this out. Dirt, 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 and then over to forest floor. There we go, very nice. And back over to dirt. And so basically that's exactly what I recommend doing for every single material in your level. And you can even test this out by just running around your level and seeing if default ever prints. And if default prints, then you know you missed something. So I'm just gonna spend the next couple of minutes just going through all the core materials in the level, updating the physical materials, and then we'll come back and we'll do the second half of this episode. All right, so once we've got physical materials assigned to every single material being used in our level here, what's our next step? So now we gotta start playing different sounds based on the material, right? So let's go back into our animation blueprint. And we're already getting the surface type here, but I'm gonna get rid of our print string. But how do we actually switch our sound that we're gonna play based on that surface type? We're gonna use what's called a switch. So if I drag out a pin, 
and I say switch on e physical surface, and then I can connect this up to the true. So here's how this is working. From our player's hip, we're doing a sphere collision trace downward. When it hits something, then it's breaking that hit result, returning the surface type, and then based on whatever surface type it gets, whether it's grass, the forest floor, stone, etc., then there's an execution pin, then it can do something. And so what is it going to do? Well, it's going to play a sound at location. And then the question is, well, what's the location that's playing the sound? And we've got our location right here, and that's the location of the actual hit. So I'm going to do a reroute node, and that's just so I can organize, because we're going to have a lot of these sounds, a lot of the spaghetti all over the place. Don't worry, by the end of the episode, we're going to clean up the spaghetti a lot, but just to start, this is what we're going to do. So from that reroute node, I'll connect it here. And so now, let's just focus on our running sound. So forest floor running. So if I search for footstep, and I could search for forest, and then we've got our forest floor, I could scroll down to our sound cue, floor run cue. The other thing I really like doing, and I talked about this two episodes ago, is I really like varying up the pitch just slightly for every single sound. And that way, every sound sounds slightly differently, but still within a reasonable frame. And so our pitch multiplier here, I'm just gonna vary this by about 0.05, like 5%. So if I do a random float in range, and instead of one, this is gonna be 0.95 to 1.05. I could drag this down here. We don't need to worry about a rotation for a sound because it's emanating in a sphere. We don't need to worry about attenuation because we already assigned that in our sound cues. The only thing we need to do is we need to create one of these for every single individual path here. So that's what I'm going to do now. So I'll just duplicate, connect these up. Now for this one, footstep grass. And we'll just connect the same randomized to each of the pitch multipliers. And the same with the location. Let's just do one more and then we'll test this out. So let's do it for dirt. And for dirt, the footstep is actually gravel, is what I renamed it. So gravel run Q. Pitch multiplier and our location. All right, so now for stone, wet dirt, wood, it's not going to play anything, but at least for forest floor, grass, and dirt, we should get sounds. But the other thing is, as it currently stands, it's only playing on the left foot. So let's also do the same thing for our right foot. Now, towards the end of this episode, we're gonna change it so that the sphere trace downward is actually gonna emanate from the right hip and the left hip so that it matches each foot. Because theoretically, you could have a different surface that the player is stepping on on one side of their body versus the other. The other thing I'm gonna do here just for testing is I'm still gonna do a print string and I'm just gonna connect up the surface type. And so that way I can connect what I'm hearing with what I'm seeing in the top left corner of our screen. There's the dirt, there's our forest floor. I can barely hear it, but that's appropriate, right? Because it is gonna be pretty soft. All right, so now let's finish our last few. So we've got our stone, our wet dirt, and wood. Now for wet dirt, I'm not gonna deal with that yet and I'll explain why, but let's do stone and wood. Footstep stone running. Same thing with our pitch. Same thing with our location. And last one for wood. All right, final test here. So we've got our gravel. Onto our stairs. Yep, stone. Wood. Pretty good. Back on the gravel, on the grass. Grass is very quiet. But here's the problem. So walking is making the same exact sounds as running. Now, if you want the same exact sounds for walking as running, well, that's fine. But we've got a separate set of sounds for them. So let's use them. So how do we use a separate set of sounds or sound cues for walking? Well, we need to determine whether or not the character is walking or running. And so to do that, we need to look at a variable of some kind. If we come down here to essential movement data, we have our ground speed right here. And this is what I'm gonna go off of. So basically, if the ground speed exceeds a certain threshold, I'm gonna consider that running, and then it's gonna use one set of sounds. And if the ground speed is below that threshold, then it's gonna be walking. It'll use a completely different set of sounds. So how do we do that? Well, I'm gonna disconnect here, and I'm gonna move all this stuff out because basically we're gonna have two sets of these, one for walking and this one's for running. And off of the print string here, this is where we're going to have a branch, and the branch is going to connect to our ground speed. But the problem is we can't connect our float here to a Boolean, so we need to assess it based on a threshold. So I'm gonna set that threshold to be 300. So if it's greater than 300, so greater than, then it's gonna be running. So I'm gonna connect this up here, 
And then if it's less than 300, then it's going to be walking. And so I'm going to create a separate set of all of this for walking. And then I'm going to move this down here. Now for the second set here, we've got to change out all of our sounds so that we're using our walking sounds. So footstep forest and come down all the way to the bottom floor walking cue. Make sure you select the cue and not the individual sounds because then sound will sound exactly the same every single time. This is going to be dirt and then dirt walking. So there we go. We just got to connect up our location. And I know this spaghetti is getting kind of crazy, but don't worry, we're going to fix all of this by the end of the episode right there. And then we also got to connect up our switch there. So surface type all the way down here. Boom. Let's test this out again. So one sound and then we switch to walking. Totally different sound. Sorry, you can't even hear that because of the birds. So let me move over. Totally different walking sound. All right, so now I have another problem. You might not have this problem in your landscape or for your level, but it's a problem for me. And let me show you what I mean. So if I come over to, yeah, let's say the fire quadrant of our garden. So I have some parts of our level here that are basically this, this wet dirt here. And my intention with that originally was to use it on the sides of our rivers. So where the sides of our rivers kind of meet the quadrant, can't even see it because of all, yeah, there you go. But the problem is this isn't a specific paintable layer because the way I created this is using a height-based layer in our landscape material. So what that means is the mechanism that we use for the parts of our landscape, like the air quadrant, earth quadrant, fire quadrant, that's not gonna work for this. So how can we determine that that's the right sound to play? So what I came up with is if the Z, basically if the height of the collision is below a certain threshold based on our landscape material, then it's gonna play that wet dirt sound. Now, like I said, this might not be relevant to you, so feel free to skip over this portion if you're not using a height-based landscape material. But I think this is the best solution if you are using that. The first thing we need to do is we need to figure out the threshold. So if the footstep is below a certain Z value, that's when it starts playing the wet dirt sound. So the way I'm gonna figure out that threshold is I'm gonna break our location here. So break our vector three, and we're just gonna get the Z, and I'm gonna print that right here. So I'll get rid of this, compile, save. And let me show you how this is going to work. So I'm just gonna move my player start over to the fire quadrant here so I could show you this. So what I'm doing here is I'm measuring where the grass starts turning into the wet dirt. So if I just kind of watch my footsteps there, yeah, so it looks to me to be about, probably about negative 60, negative 65 Z value. So that's what we're gonna set as the threshold. So the first thing is I'm just gonna get rid of all this and I'll connect this up. And the next thing is under location here, I'm just gonna break again. And now I need to set a threshold. So Z, I'll drag this out and I'll say if it's less than, and I'll say if it's less than negative 65, and I'll do a branch here. And I'll connect this to be false because if it's not less than negative 65, then we want it to do all the regular sounds, right? And we're not even going to have the wet dirt in that case because it's not below that threshold. But if it is greater than negative 65, what do we want to have happen? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate all of this stuff. And I realize this is kind of ridiculous, but we're going to copy all of this. I'm going to paste it way out there. This is all temporary, I promise. True, we're going to connect all this up if i could find it somewhere in the vicinity there we go and we're going to do the same exact logic right but it's a little bit different in this case because if it's forest floor or grass or dirt that's all going to connect up to the wet dirt sound i'll do sound and we'll do footstep wet dirt and this is going to be for running and i'm going to connect everything up to this grass dirt not stone, because potentially we could have some stone objects below sea level. And same thing with wood, but wet dirt, yep. And then I can delete out this, I could delete out this one, and we'll just keep the three. I still gotta connect up our location all the way up there. And the same with the second one down below. And this is our walking sounds. And we also have to connect up, of course, our surface type here and one more. Surface type all the way up there. Move these up as well. We're gonna do the same thing here for our walking sounds on wet dirt. So forest floor, 
still going to be there. Grass to that one as well. Dirt to that one as well. Wet dirt as well. Delete out this and this. And this one's going to be footstep, wet dirt, walking. There we go. Compile, save. All right, moment of truth here. So let's give it a whirl. So there we go. And now up to grass. Yeah, and beyond that threshold, it's working. And below that threshold, wet dirt. Perfect. So this isn't going to work if you're using multiple types of landscapes where some are height-based layers and some aren't. And so that might be a good argument to just stick with paintable layers in that regard. So now let's talk about how do we clean up our build? Because as it currently stands, it's atrocious. Let me just move all of this stuff, which was the stuff we started with up there. And just look at this. I mean, honestly, it's not all that complicated because we're just taking the same stuff and we've got four different sets of it. But it just looks awful. All sorts of spaghetti. So normally what I would do is I would collapse this to a function and be done with it. But here's the thing, you heard me say all the way in the beginning of this episode that I want these footstep sounds to be usable by any human humanoid character across our game. And if I just make a function on our animation blueprint here, this is our third person character animation blueprint. I don't want to have to access that every single time I want to play a footstep sound for any character, right? So what if we could take these functions and we can make them universally accessible? And that's exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to use a blueprint function library to do that. So to start, I want you to minimize this. We're going to go back to our content drawer. We're going to go back to our content folder and I'm going to create a brand new folder called blueprint function libraries. Got to watch that caps lock function libraries. And then within that folder, I'm actually going to have a couple of subfolders. So this is going to be for pawn because we're going to have functions that are not for pawns that are for other things, but I'm going to go into pawn and then we're going to have a subfolder for human. So basically these are sounds or really any sorts of functions that are specifically designed for human characters. And now in this new folder, I'm going to right click and we're going to search under blueprints for a blueprint function library. And I'm going to call this human character underscore BFL, your big friendly library. So if I double click on that, our first function here, this is going to be called footstep sound. Now here's how this is going to work. So from our third person character animation blueprint, or really any animation blueprint, we can then access this footstep sound function off of this library. But when we access the function, we actually have to send it a few pieces of information in order for it to do the appropriate thing. So let me show you what I mean. So what information are we accessing off of our hit result? So first of all, we're accessing what was the location of the hit, right? And then we're also accessing the physical material. And the last piece of information we need to know is how fast is that character going? Because the footstep sound is going to change whether or not that threshold is exceeded. And so how do we pass information into our footstep sound function here? So if I select that function, on the right hand side in the details panel, you have your inputs and your outputs. And so we're not going to have any outputs because the sound is actually going to play right here in the function. But for inputs, this is exactly where we've got to set these to receive the information. So we're going to create three new inputs. So I'll hit plus sign. So this first one's going to be our impact location. And what was our location here? Well, it's a vector, right? So we got to make that match. So the type here is going to be vector. And you see it then creating a pin here in addition to our execution pin, which is what it's actually going to do. And we'll create a second input. And this is going to be our impact physical material. So what was the physical material that was hit? And so this is going to be a type physical material, which is predictable. Object reference. And then our last one. And this one's going to be our movement ground speed. One word. Always keep these one word. This is just going to be a simple float. Compile, save. So now let's take all of our spaghetti, all of our logic from here, and we're going to copy it all in. So I'm going to select everything here. I forgot this the break vector three F. I forgot this as well. Copy all those, everything except the break hit result. And then we'll go into our new function and we'll paste that in. And so now from here, I can connect this up to our execution pin. I can connect the break vector right here. For these vector pins here, these reroute nodes, I could connect those all up. So let's do that. So connect up there. And I apologize, guys, I've got this in 4K. So this is going to be very small. But I think if I zoom in all the way, you can get a sense of it. And one more down towards the bottom here. 
Oh, I'm missing one more at the top here. Don't worry, we're going to take care of all this spaghetti, I promise. And the last thing, physical material to the surface type. We forgot one thing, right? The ground speed, that's not working. So we got to delete out that. And instead, we got to connect up our movement ground speed like this. And we also got one up here, same thing. So I will connect that up, movement ground speed up to there. So now, how do we access this function on our third person character animation blueprint? So if we go back to that blueprint, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to disconnect this right here just by holding alt and disconnecting. I'm going to drag all this out and don't delete this quite yet because we don't know for certain that it's going to work, right? We've got to actually test this out. So I'm just going to drag it all down there. It's out of the way. And now we can just search for our function. So our function is called footstep sound and I'm going to search for footstep sound and you see it under human character BFL. Perfect. And we've got our three inputs for our function right there. We can connect up true. And then we can connect up our physical material. We can connect up our location. And the last thing I can just drag in a reference to ground speed here, connect that up there. And now theoretically, this should be doing the same exact thing that all this was doing. The only difference is it's doing it on this independent blueprint function library. So let's give it a go. We'll compile, save, test this out. I can barely hear the grass, but it is there. I hear the rocks. Yes. Everything's functioning appropriately, all systems normal. All right, great. But you heard me say, let's clean up the spaghetti. So the first thing is, let's delete out all the craziness out of our third person animation blueprint. So let's delete out all this. We don't need it anymore. We confirmed that the blueprint function library is functioning as hoped. So now we go over to our BFL. Now, how do we get rid of all of the spaghetti? So for this, so instead of dragging off a million pins here, what we're going to do instead is create what are called local variables and think of local variables as simply a way of storing the data locally. So we're not using this data outside of this blueprint. We're not using it outside of the function in any regard, but it's just an easy way to clean up all of this mess. And so at the very start of our function, that's exactly what we're going to do. So if you right click on impact location here and you just say promote to local variable, and then we've got to rename it. And that's going to create a local variable there on the left hand side. And for this, I'm just going to right click rename and this I'm going to rename to footstep location. And then we're going to do that for the other two. So you right click on the pin, just say promote to local variable, drag that up here, right click rename. This is going to be footstep physical material. Same thing here, right click on movement ground speed, promote to local variable, drag it up, right click rename. Footstep ground speed. Perfecto. All right, let's move these down, connect these to there, connect them here, connect them there. And then, so we're setting, so what this is doing is it's setting the three local variables to be each of these. And then we connect it up and it still does all the same stuff. But here's the thing we haven't yet set our local variables to be what are used. So instead of this giant spaghetti here, we can instead use our local variable. So I can drag in a reference, get, and we can just connect these up here. And for this one, we just have to get the surface type. And then we can connect that up. And for that, I'm just going to copy it, paste it a few times. One last copy pasta. I guess I got an Italian theme going. We still got, yep, we still got one spaghetti. Let's get rid of this one. And to get rid of this one, we're just gonna say footstep ground speed. And I think there's one more that I, yep, this one right here. I believe we are now set, but of course, what do we gotta do? Of course, we gotta test it. I really like uh, basically creating reroutes here and just, well, this one too, I'm gonna get another reference. Call me a neat freak. I like organizing these so that they're just not overlapping at all. All right, and then these, I'm gonna move back over a little bit. I am gonna comment on all this, but let's just test real quick. Give it a whirl. Still working, great. Our local variables functioning locally and appropriately. To switch over to our 5,000 run speed so I could test elsewhere. Yep, sounding good. But now the last thing, let's comment our build. If Z is less than negative 65, then use wet dirt 
sound for all landscape materials. And for this one, I'm just gonna say Z greater than negative 65, regular landscape sounds. No wet dirt. Drag this out just to make sure it's all encompassing. This one is gonna be for walking. And then this one is for, of course, running footstep sounds. Last thing I recommend doing is you can just collapse these so that only the nodes that are actually showing something show. That just cleans it up a little bit more. I would do that very last because just in case you need to alter any of the parameters. So that cleaned this up considerably, huh? So we can compile and save and over to our third person character here. So the last thing I wanna go over is the jump landing. And for this, we're gonna do a very similar thing uh, and see if you can actually do this yourself after the first step, because I think based on everything we've already done, you could probably figure out the rest of it yourself. It's a good test for you. But the very first thing I'm gonna show you, which we haven't done before, is we've gotta create two brand new animation notifies, anim notifies here. So if we go back to our content drawer, and we've gotta navigate back over to our characters, our mannequins, animations, and Manny or Quinn, whichever one you're using, and we've gotta go into our landing the jump animation. And so for this, we got to create two additional anim notifies, two brand new ones, because these sounds are going to be different, and that's how we're going to differentiate them from walking or running. So we're actually going to have a different anim notify. So to do that, we can right click on that same line where we just added an existing one before, but this time we're going to go to add notify, and instead of skeleton notifies here, we can do a new notify. And I'm going to name this one jump land left. And I'm going to do the left first because you see the left foot lands first and it's all the way at the start. And then if I come over to where the right foot is, right about maybe there, well, I'm just gonna right click anywhere. Say add notify, new notify, jump land right. And I'll just move this over to match it up. Save that. So now back in our third person character blueprint, we could just say jump land left. There's our atom notify, and then we've got our jump land right. Now for this, we're doing the same kind of thing, right? The only difference is we're gonna need a different function here specifically for jump landing because the sounds are gonna be a little different. And so I'm just gonna copy all of this. I'm gonna copy this, copy this, and I'm just gonna paste that down below. I'll get rid of this custom event. That was an accident. So we'll connect this up, connect this up. And so now we just need a different function instead of the footstep sound function. So if I come back to human character BFL, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click on the function, I'm gonna say duplicate, and this one I'm gonna name jump land sound. And we've got everything in there already, which is perfect. But for this, we don't need to differentiate between running and walking, right? So I can actually cut out this, and I can cut out the walking part of this, and same down here, because jumping, it's gonna be the same sound regardless of whether the player jumps when walking or jumping when running. Cut that out. And I'll just connect this up. This is gonna be the false directly, and this is gonna be the true directly. And I'm just gonna change our comment here to be jump, land, footstep sounds. And now we just gotta switch out our sounds here. So this is our wet dirt, so footstep, wet dirt, jump, land, and this is our stone. Stone jump land. I think you get the idea at this point. This one's footstep dirt jump land. Compile and save. So now let's go back to our third person character blueprint and let's, instead of the footstep sound, let's connect up our footstep jump land. I just searched for jump land, jump land sound. There we go. Physical material, all three hooked up. Ready to test. So this should be a little bit louder. Yeah, so there we go. Now there is one problem with this as it stands because right when the animation begins, the player's left foot is already on the ground. So if your jump sound sounds a little bit delayed, this is exactly what's happening. And I'm gonna save the solution to this to the next episode because this episode's already pretty long and it's gonna be perfect for what we gotta do with jumping into water. But for now, Here's what I want you to do. So we're gonna delete out our jump land left. We're gonna move right all the way over to the left there. And we're gonna have some predictive mechanism, something that actually occurs before the footstep hits to actually trigger the first jump land sound. And that's what we're gonna do next episode.
Very last thing I want to show you guys. So you heard me say that we can change our trace, our sphere trace to be based on the actual location of the feet versus the center of gravity of the player. Because as it stands, you see how the sphere collision, it's always in the same location. So it's not actually synchronized with the feet. It should be about 10 units apart according to where each foot is. So back in our animation blueprint, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make some space here. I'm gonna move this up to about there, move this one over to about here. And instead of the get world location here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the world transform get world transform. And the transform is the location, but it's also the rotation, it's also the scale, it's all of those things. And so based on that overall transform, we can transform the location. So we can say, okay, instead of that center mass location, let's move it slightly over to the right for the right foot, slightly over to the left for the left foot. And also forward a little bit because our footsteps are actually taking a step forward. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna drag out a pin, we're gonna do transform location. And this is just gonna be 30 units forward, which is the x-axis. So it's starting from 30 units forward. And because we want it to be slightly to the left side of our body, it's gonna be Y10. And then for the end, it's basically the same thing in that we're gonna copy and paste, but the Z is gonna be 120 units lower. So negative 120. We can connect that up, connect it up here. And now we've got to replicate that for the right foot, right? Because it's going to be slightly different. So we can move all of this up and I'm just going to drag this out, copy all of this stuff, paste it down below, connect this to there. The only difference here is now going to be the Y is negative 10 because now we're moving in the opposite direction relative to the center of the body. But we're still stepping forward for the right foot. So that's still going to be 30, 0 and negative 120. So let's test this out. Let's see what it looks like. So you see how now each of the collisions are slightly staggered. So one's to the left of the body, one's to the right of the body. Yeah, that's exactly what we want. And they're also, if we look at like where they're triggering relative to the feet, yeah, it's basically like right on the foot when that footstep occurs. So let's do it for jump land and we've got it. Copy and paste that down here. And for this, for the jump land, I'm not gonna do it that far forward. I'm gonna do it only about 10 units forward because it's not the same as footstep where it's actually like moving forward. And now I'll just copy and paste this entire thing. And then the Y needs to be positive. Oh, actually I reversed these. So the Y is negative for the right and then for the left it's positive. So that concludes today's episode guys, but the only thing we really haven't covered yet with footstep sounds is of course water. And water is tricky because the sound's gonna be different depending on whether the water is this deep or this deep or this deep. So that's exactly what we're gonna do in our next episode. So I hope to see you there.